arise and be bold. Good news of hope is here. The warm glow of the divine brightens our hearts. Here we are together, not alone. We join with the cloud of witnesses here, there, elsewhere, and everywhere. On this first Sunday in Advent, we will dream and imagine a different future, a rising up and life flourishing one. We are witnesses to hope. God of righteous dreaming, lighten our hearts with an enlarged imagination to dream new possibilities, to imagine a world where transformation will happen, where creation is mended and restored, and where exiles and strangers will find a home, become in our lives the way to what we need, to what we can become, and to what we can do. And now for our opening prayer. God of the faith that the bleak past taught us, God of the hope that the present has brought us, we call on you in this hour of worship. We know that you need no invocation for you are already and always with us. Emmanuel even before the child is born. We open our hearts to receive your gifts, for you are the giver of hope, the giver of peace, the giver of joy, the giver of love. Make your present known as we make ourselves available to you. Amen. And now please join us for our opening hymn, number 136, Christians All, Your Lord is Coming.
may be seated. Welcome everybody to the Congregational Church on Mercer Island. I am so thrilled that you are here, whether you're worshiping with us in person or on Zoom. Uh, I am just really thrilled to be here. Um, for announcements today, I hope you will stay for the potluck after worship. All are welcome. There is a men's breakfast next Saturday, uh, the 3rd of December at 8.30 a.m. And you are to RSVP to Aaron and Jim if you're going to be coming. There's a women's breakfast the following Saturday. And is that at 8.30 as well? That is a potluck. <laughs> it is sometime that Saturday morning. And uh, 8.30 will work. Okay, bring something to share. Um, and we are looking for volunteers to be greeters, which you can sign up at the front door. Uh, for hosts for coffee hour, which the signups are over on this table. And for Zoom hosts, which I believe you could do from home on Zoom. You wouldn't have to be here to do that. So if you are interested in doing that, please contact the church office. Um, I am aware there's a choir concert coming. Is there somebody who would like to uh, announce the details for that? Yes, DG. Yes. Hello. <laughs> I would wear my heels today. Normally I don't. But <laughs> yes, we have a concert and we really would love to see you all there. Do you like that song that we sang at the beginning? That's a little taste. It's from, from the cantata we're going to be presenting. A lot of beautiful music and candle lighting and storytelling involved in our cantata. It will take place on Sunday afternoon, December 18th at 2 o'clock. There'll be an intermission, I hear, with some cookies served. So we do hope to see you all there. Thank you. Thanks. Are there any other announcements? Yes. Now I can see this microphone thing might be a little dicey for all of you. I did not wear my heels today. I'm, it's okay, it's okay. No, no. I'm Terry with Social Outreach. Uh, final tally as of today is 4,201 hugs from our congregation and community to our homeless friends uh, through Operation Night Watch Sock Drive. We have donated 4,201 pairs of socks. And I want to thank everybody. We are, we're going to transition to the toy drive next month. I'll have more news on that next Sunday. Um, but we still are welcoming donations to pay for that order of socks from Alabama that were shipped directly to Operation Night Watch. So if you could donate, uh, if you have not already, if you have, thank you so much for your generosity. If you still want to donate, uh, we could use the website there, just specify socks on the church website donation page. Uh, if you put a check in, um, just write socks, write the check to CCMI and put socks on the subject line, or you can slip me some cash and I'll make it happen. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yes, please. Oh. <laughs> Hi, I'm Bob. Uh, several of our choir members are also members of a community choir called Northwest Firelight Chorale that DG also is the director of. And that choir is having a uh, concerts in December, uh, December 9th in West Seattle and December 16th and 17th in the University District. Uh, I left postcards out on the table out front if you uh, uh, want to take a look at that. We'd love to see as many of you there as possible. Thanks. Oh, Bob. Uh, this may be the only chance to mention this, but the newspaper announced that Don Frothingham has passed away. Don was the architect of this building, and if you take time, there are a lot of very interesting and unusual features that it has. So uh, remember Don Frothingham? 
He was an early member of the church and he has just passed away. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. And now we come to the passing of the peace. The peace is not merely a kind of liturgical halftime or a foretaste of coffee hour or a casual, hey, how are you doing? Rather, it's a tangible reminder that we are not in this alone. Whatever burdens we're carrying around, whatever pain we're holding on to, whatever hurts we bear in our hearts, God's presence abides and abides through our connections with one another. So if you're worshiping on Zoom right now, please share your greetings of peace in the chat. And if you are worshiping here in the sanctuary, please stand and greet one another with the peace of Christ. May the peace of Christ be with you all. I can use this microphone. Well, <laughs> obviously, we will need more.
Our first reading this morning is Blessing of Hope by Jan Richardson. So may we know the hope that is not just for someday, but for this day, here, now, in this moment that opens to us, hope not made of wishes, but of substance, hope made of sinew and muscle and bone, hope that has breath and a beating heart, hope that will not keep quiet and be polite, hope that knows how to holler when it is called for, hope that knows how to sing when there seems little cause, Hope that raises us from the dead, not someday, but this day, every day, again and again and again. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the 13th chapter of Romans, verses 11 through 14. And this is from the message translation. But make sure that you don't get so absorbed and exhausted in taking care of all your day by day obligations that you lose track of the time and doze off oblivious to God. The night is about over. Dawn is about to break. Be up and awake to what God is doing. God is putting the finishing touches on the salvation work God began when we first believed. We can't afford to waste a minute. Must not squander these precious daylight hours in frivolity and indulgence, in sleeping around and dissipation in bickering and grabbing everything in sight. Get out of bed and get dressed. Don't loiter and linger, waiting until the very last minute. Dress yourselves in Christ and be up and about. Will you please pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. I hope you all had a wonderful Thanksgiving. I am so happy to be here on my first official Sunday as your pastor and on the first Sunday of the Christian calendar. As you have for sure noticed by now, today is the first Sunday in Advent, which also happens to be my favorite liturgical season. I am so happy to be starting my ministry with you in this time of Advent, a season full of reflection, anticipation, and new beginnings. We will move through this next month in eager anticipation of the Christ child's birth, a celebration of hope, peace, joy, and love coming into the world. The theme I have chosen for Advent this year is begin again, as we begin again together. And today we are focusing on beginning again with hope. Begin again with hope. That has a nice ring to it, right? Today is a day filled with hope. For me, as I begin my ministry with you, and for us as the Congregational Church on Mercer Island. We begin a new season, a new church year, filled with anticipation and curiosity about how we will serve God, our neighbors, and one another together. We have wonder and hope about how my particular gifts and skills will fit with yours, a 
and how we will work together for the thriving of this beloved church. It is a time of celebration, and I am so pleased to be starting our journey together today. But at the same time, we know that for many, hope may feel nearly impossible these days. I don't know about you, but my mind has been consumed of late with a feeling of despair at the proliferation of mass shootings, which seem like they have become almost an everyday occurrence in our nation. I read just this morning that there was another shooting last night at a mall in Atlanta. They're coming so fast that we are barely able to acknowledge the loss of precious life before our attention is drawn to the next shooting. And maddeningly, our country, with all its riches and power, with our government and our institutions, seems completely unable to respond. And if we are honest, we too are often frozen in how we respond, as we aren't sure how to take action. And instead, what we are left with is a growing sense of danger, helplessness, and foreboding. And this is especially true for those who have been marginalized, who are targeted because of skin color or religious expression, or for those daring to claim their queer identity and live as their true selves. In the face of this, it is hard to have hope. And there are so many other things going on in our world that make it hard to have hope. Economic worries, the war in Ukraine, the mass protests in Iran, our severely divided political system, climate change. It seems like bad news is everywhere. Couple that with our own personal challenges or those of people we love, and we may struggle to find any hope at all. And as a result, many of us fall into the very human tendency to numb ourselves, which helps us to avoid feeling scared and vulnerable. We may do this in a variety of ways, including mindlessly scrolling through social media, which is probably my personal favorite, or by keeping ourselves crazy busy, or by binge watching TV, or by drinking too much, or by playing video games for hours on end. You get the idea. These numbing behaviors may help us cope in the short term, but are problematic as long-term strategies. Because when we engage in them, we fall asleep to what God is doing and will continue to do, both in our own lives and in the world. We fall asleep to what God is doing. We simply stop paying attention. We fail to notice the hopeful signs all around us. And our scripture lesson today has something to say about this. This passage comes from one of the revised common lectionary texts for the first Sunday in Advent from the Apostle Paul's letter to the church in Rome. This letter generally provides instructions for how to live and was intended to provide direction, encouragement, and guidance to the early Christian community there. We should remind ourselves of the context in which this letter was written, though. Paul was writing to a persecuted people a religious minority with much to fear. And so we can imagine that hope was a scarce commodity for them as well. 
And I particularly love this translation from the message version of the Bible as it conveys the urgency of Paul's message to the Christians in Rome. It reads, make sure that you don't get so absorbed and exhausted in taking care of your, all your day by day obligations that you lose track of the time and doze off, oblivious to God. I don't know about you, but when I read this, I felt a little called out by it. Because don't we spend almost all our time absorbed and exhausted in taking care of day-by-day -day obligations? I confess that I do, even though I'm a pastor. We don't slow down enough to pay attention to the movement of the Spirit happening around us. Paul goes on to say the night is about over. Dawn is about to break. Be up and awake to what God is doing. Now Paul is offering an antidote to fear, to hopelessness, to helplessness here. He exhorts us to wake up and pay attention to the movement of God in the world. Now yesterday, 10 of us gathered here to prepare the building and worship space for Advent. We were busy hanging banners and wreaths and swag. And Jonathan, who I don't think is here, but he was the MVP because he climbed the ladder to hang that wreath. <laughs> oh, he is here. <laughs> there you are, Jonathan. At one point, though, Jania had a moment that surprised her. She was standing at the top of the stairs over there when she started to cry unexpectedly. And she was giving me permission to tell you this story. I'm... She didn't know why she was crying at first, but she soon realized that she was channeling the moment in her son's wedding when he was singing to his bride-to-be as the bride was descending the very same staircase where Jania was standing. The Holy Spirit was breaking through. These moments of connection to the divine are gifts and act as spiritual sustenance if we let them. And I noticed a similar awakening to the spirit when I attended the women's Bible study a few weeks ago. At that meeting, several participants mentioned that their study about Sabbath helped them pay attention to the daily moments of Sabbath in their lives in ways they hadn't noticed before. Their study and focused attention helped them experience the presence of God, which I find to be inherently hope-filled. Friends, God's movement in the world is ever-present, always beginning again. In preparing this sermon, I found a helpful quote on the UCC website, which reads, one of the essential paradoxes of Advent is that while we wait for God, we are with God all along. That while we need to be reassured of God's arrival or the arrival of our homecoming, we are already at home. While we wait, we have to trust, to have faith, but it is God's grace that gives us that faith. As with all spiritual knowledge, two things are true and equally true at once. The mind can't grasp paradox. It is the knowledge of the soul. God is indeed working among us and through us right now even as we wait and anticipate the birth of Jesus. Paul urges us to pay attention, to wake from our spiritual slumber, to pay attention to the hope of God all around us, despite our busyness or exhaustion or preoccupied minds. 
Now, I don't know how many of you noticed me putting this mug up on here, and you may think, what the heck is she doing? It seems pretty ironic on its face that a mug that says hope on it is broken. You may wonder why I didn't just get rid of it. But a dear friend that I worked with for years, through many ups and downs, gave me this mug. She gave it to me just like this, already broken, on her last day of working for our organization. Quite a gift, right? A broken mug? But I'll never forget the words she said when she gave it to me. She said, Jennifer, I want this mug to be a reminder to you that you must hold on to hope, no matter how hard it is. Hold on to hope no matter if your hope is broken or the way you have held on to hope in the past no longer works. Just hold on, nevertheless. Hold on, nevertheless. In that moment, this broken mug became much more. It became a powerful symbol for me. And this broken mug has a prominent place in my office, has had a prominent place in my office ever since, as it now does in my office upstairs. So some people display trophies, I display broken mugs. In Jan Richardson's poem, A Blessing for Hope, read so beautifully by Barb, we hear about a hope made of substance, of sinew and muscle and bone, an embodied hope, if you will. When I read the phrase in the scripture passage about dressing ourselves in Christ, I thought of this poem. For we must have hope, but we can also be hope to one another and the world. When you provide over 4,200 socks for those experiencing homelessness, you are hope. When you participate in the toy drive every December for the children served by the Atlantic Street Center, you are hope. When you care for your neighbors and for one another, you are hope. As the church, we have the opportunity to bring hope to a broken and hurting world. And not only that, but in the words of Paul, to dress ourselves in Christ and be hope, to be the movement of God. So while we wait in anticipation this Advent, let's wake up, dust ourselves off, and begin again. Let's pay attention and join in the movement of the Spirit. Let us awaken from our cynicism, from our numbness, from our resistance, and let us begin again in hope. Amen. Thank you.
We now continue with hymn number 142, People Look. Please receive this benediction. Life is short, and we do not have much time to gladden the hearts of those with whom we walk this way. So be swift to love, and make haste to be kind. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Creator, the Christ, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen.